personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, my name is Debbie Reynolds. They call me the Data Diva. This is the Data Diva Talks Privacy Podcast, where we discuss data privacy issues with industry leaders around the world with information that businesses need to know right now. I have a special guest on the show, Mark Dobson. He is the IT Asset Disposition Program Manager at Next Use. Hi, Mark. Hi, Debbie. So this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. This is going to be a little bit different too uh, for the audience. So um, I've been following you on LinkedIn for many years now. I really love your content. Uh, you sort of go at it from a lot of different angles. Um, but one, one of the things that you talk about a lot and the thing that interests me and the reason why I think it's important for you to be on the show is that you have a lot of deep, real world war story experiences about kind of the the end of digital transformation. So a lot of companies, they do rah-rah things around digital transformation. But at some point, you know, after the big, you know, reveal and people, you know, install these systems, you know, these systems age out, right? So they, the software ages out, the hardware ages out, and then companies have to deal with how do they dispose of that data or that equipment. And so I call it the flip side of digital transformation. I call it digital degradation. (laughs) So, but but people don't talk about it a lot, and a lot of companies don't do it well. Uh, and there are data privacy implications for that. So there are kind of breach of security, you know, typical cyber data breach. You know, there as we see, regulators are really pulling the hammer down on companies and how they sort of transfer data to third parties. So I thought it'd be great to have you on the show and and and, and talk about kind of your your work at NextUse and, and sort of your journey into this field. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. I was super excited that you approached me for this opportunity because as you can tell from my work on LinkedIn, I basically spend a lot of time trying to educate uh, C-level, VP-level, um, you know, IT director level and up um, contacts at companies about uh, this industry. Um, and a, just a little bit about how I got to where I am doing this. So I've been doing IT related sales and marketing roles and support roles for various IT startups for uh, about 25 years now, um, getting a little snow on the roof here, as you can see. And um, I came into doing ITAD specifically, IT asset disposition, interestingly enough, not from the data security perspective, but because there's a huge e-waste problem. Uh, It's gonna become a major part of the ecological crisis that we're facing. But then when I got into the industry, I realized that uh, data privacy uh, and data loss was actually as big, if not a bigger risk uh, to our society than the uh, the e-waste. Really, uh, one of the reasons I decided to go to work with NextUse was simply because they are, those are their two top priorities. Uh, NextUse is really a specialized data security, uh, you know, house. That's what they do. They have a data lab, uh, 360 ports of simultaneous overwriting, and they're really structured towards uh, not adding, you know, drives into the e-waste stream to uh, properly sanitizing the drives of all sorts. That's their number one priority. Their number two priority is the uh, ecological impact aspect. And, um, and somewhere in there, they actually managed to make money, which is you know uh, sort of the core of any business, but it's, it's certainly not their priority as it is for many uh, vendors in this industry. So um, we, aligned, um, we aligned ethically, I think, which is really kind of important. And the staff there, they're all, as I joked around in some of my content, it's a, it's a calling, not a job. A lot of the people there, they are there because this is the sort of stuff they prioritize. And in turn, they, um, it shows in their work ethic and what they're doing in their prioritizing of clients. 
That, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, you know, this is this also isn't the most sexy topic, right? So I think I'll talk about it from an executive perspective. So if you're in an organization or you're working with an organization and they're they have the servers that are aged out, things that need to be gotten rid of. You know, a lot of times those things end up locked in back rooms or given away. You know, I've seen people do that. Um, but the, the problem comes with the data a lot of times is on those devices. So, um, you know, it's very, you know, you can't just throw it in the garbage. OK, you can't you shouldn't give it to your neighbor, or your friend or whatever. You definitely shouldn't do that. And then there there is a cost involved with uh, sanitizer, taking the data off those drives. And then uh, one thing that I used to do, not server related, but like, you know, the detachable hard drives, whatever, like I would never reuse those. So uh, that's another thing that people get wrong with sort of data stuff. So they may not overwrite the drive properly to put anything new on it. Um, and so what I used to do is that I would only use the drive once. <laughs> I wouldn't use it again for anything else. Uh, and I definitely wouldn't let it out of my possession if I didn't, if I wasn't 100% sure that it could be wiped, you know, DLD style if needed. Um, uh, but, you know, that's a very time consuming process, as you say. Uh, but tell me, tell me, um, Tell me what what typically happens and then tell me what should happen when people have this situation where they have uh, like they have hardware that has data on it and how they should handle uh, that that process. Sure. Uh, So you pretty much hit the nail right on the head. Um, And in the two and a half years I've been working with Nexus and doing uh, program management for them for ITAD, we've seen it all. And a lot of it is really shocking. Um, I would go so far as to say in some cases, horrifying. Um, some of the use cases that I've seen uh, align very much with what you're talking about. So you'll have, uh, you'll, we'll be called on site or we'll be contacted about coming on site. And it will literally be anywhere from a year to 10 years worth of assets uh, piled up. Uh, now, a lot of times these are not in secure facilities. Um, they're, you know, they're in a building, but the room they're in might lock, it might not not lock, it might be an IT storage space that the door is frequently left open while people are coming or going, or they think it's the junk room, there's no reason to secure it. Um, And, you know, unfortunately, Debbie, we're not talking about, uh, you know, uh, lumber companies or uh, ice cream vendors here, we're talking about right up to financial services firms, hospitals and other healthcare providers, uh, there's really just a, uh, a, a real blind spot is a term I like to use a lot for data security and for the um, value of maintaining chain of custody on those assets. So a, a big part of my network on LinkedIn happens to be uh, from people in IT asset management or ITAM. And they're actually, uh, that and data security, like cybersecurity folks like CISOs tend to be some of our biggest allies because they get it. Right, they understand that those assets go from a cycle, uh, all the way from purchasing to in production to end of life to uh, a term you hear a lot of times is reverse logistics, where the stuff then goes back to either into a second life, which is what we always prioritize because of the environmental impact, or at least getting properly recycled. Um, so we are always running into this clash or very frequently we run into this clash where there's a room full of junk people. That's how they perceive it. They want to get rid of it. They want to do it as cheaply as possible, or they want to make money from it. Um, And uh, meanwhile, we come in saying, great. And just so you know, there are tons of unqualified vendors that'll do that for you with varying levels of risk. Um, And again, some of the use cases we could talk about today, we're talking like, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of risk. Uh, Or we can start off the process right for you by taking the assets, auditing them, uh, data sanitizing them, and reporting on them in, you know, in basically nauseating detail. So for example, um, we get clients all the time that say, um, good news, we don't need to pay for data sanitizing. Why not? Nothing we're going to give you has any data on it. And we, you know, we try not to smirk, but we're like, okay, sure, that sounds good. 
And so we don't write that into the statement of work or anything. We don't put it on the quote. And, but we do make sure they understand that what we're going to do when we get that stuff is look first and foremost for data and sanitize it. And then that's how Next Use lands most of its long-term clients, by the way. Um, don't do a lot of advertising. Don't do a lot of outbound sales efforts. But we get a client and we report back to them to say, we pulled 30 or 50 or 100 drives, hard drives, uh, solid state drives, non-volatile memory, out of devices that they didn't even realize had any data storage you know, capability at all. And we give them data destruction certificates with itemized lists of those assets. And the drives are all serialized. So we provide the serial number of all the drives. And usually that's enough for them to understand that uh, a well-qualified vendor is operating in their best interests. And, uh, and that really makes a lot of them very loyal repeat clients very quickly. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about data sanitization. For people who don't know what this entails, it's a lot. Okay. So it isn't, you know, people think, okay, I go on my computer, I see some files, I'll delete those files, and then I'm good. And we know that that does not <laughs> work. So tell me, tell me, a little bit about that data sanitization. I think you all do, you do DOD, Department of Defense level sanitization. Well, I, how, how many wipes or how many write overs do you do in your sanitization process? Sure. Uh, well, this is a pretty complex topic, but I prefer not to speak very technically. So I'm going to keep this as um, accessible as possible. But essentially, um, a lot of people, like you said, think that if they, uh, if they reformat the hard drive, for example, that they've uh, wiped out the data. But in reality, all that does is it, is it removes the table that tells the drive where the data is stored, but it doesn't remove the data itself. And so with even modestly publicly accessible um, data um, accessing software, that data can all be retrieved. So just that basic understanding that uh, overriding the drive is a, is done with specialized hardware and software. It's very energy intensive. Bigger drives can take hours and hours. Every single sector is being overwritten. Um, it's so it's energy intensive. It's labor intensive. They all have to be loaded into and pulled out of drive bays on these specialized uh, hardware. That's not even counting having the personnel trained and having the company certified. There's a huge amount of investment that goes into meeting these certification standards. I'm sure anybody who's done an ISO certification can tell you it's not cheap or easy. Uh, the certifications that Nexus uses is called NAID, uh, the National Information National Association for Information Destruction, and their AAA standard is uh, incredibly detailed, incredibly intensive, and comes with uh, quite a, a cost as well. Um, so that's. Um, there's a big disconnect, I think, in a lot of people's minds about, um, like you said, that it's just easy. We can just push a button. We can run a program. In reality, it's um, it's a big time and effort, and and there's an expense associated with it as well to doing it properly. And let's talk a little bit about this uh, this particular certification. So there are only 13 companies in the world that have this. Uh, triple a certification from this organization and there are only five in the u.s and you're one of those five is that correct uh actually i updated that that data gets updated all the time so there's currently six organizations in the u.s that have the set of uh nay triple a certifications that next use holds and that's the ability to either go onto a client site or bring uh these assets back to the facility so either one to uh, either physically destroy, uh, degauss, or overwrite the data on hard drives, solid state drives, or non-volatile memory. And in addition to that, the ability to uh, either physically destroy or overwrite the data on, um, on uh, non-digital media. So that would be things like magnetic tapes, um, disk, like floppy disk, USB drives. Uh, that comprehensive set, to be able to do everything in that realm related to data, only six uh, companies in the U.S., including Nexus, have that set of certs. And right now, interestingly enough, Debbie, there's a renaissance going on. <laughs> so in Australia, the Australian government basically codified this right into their laws that if you are going to be doing anything with their government or like a subcontractor, you have to use a vendor that's NAID AAA certified 
and nothing drives getting gold standard certification like the government telling you you have to do it. So these companies in Australia, now we're up to 20 companies worldwide who have, the, um, who have made AAA certification to that level where they can basically cover everything from soup to nuts. Um, there are probably, if I had to just guess, there's probably closer to 100 vendors that have pieces of that. So they might be able to do physical drive destruction or they might be able to do uh, they might be able to do physical drive degaussing, or they might be able to do solid state drive overriding. So there's a lot of ven vendors that have bits and pieces of this, um, which it's still it's better than uh, it's better than going with a lower qualifying standard, of which there are two, and I can go into detail about that with you if you'd like as well. Right, right, excellent, excellent. So I like to tell companies if you have data that has a low business value it has a high cyber or privacy risk because a lot of times companies you know if it is a kind of the high value data at the time they aren't securing it in the same way you know maybe like you said maybe it's in a room you know not a special room maybe not even a locked door you know stock in storage in a box somewhere um you know connected to the internet sometimes you know not updated and stuff like that. So I see that type of risk that companies take and they don't really think about it. Um, a lot of times it comes, sometimes it comes into light when companies are hit with litigation and they have to get data, you know, so the data that they had at that moment, even if it's kind of old and in a back room, it may be subject to that litigation. And so, so part of it is, companies need to do a better job of getting rid of data, you know, figuring out what is kind of, you know, what has the high business value. If it doesn't have a high business value, get rid of it because it creates that cyber and that privacy risk. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that's the, a, a big part of um, ITAD is companies realizing that the real value, the real cost has nothing to do with the hardware. It has everything to do with the data. And so the chain of custody on these assets, it's physical because they're physical assets, but it's really chain of custody on the data from the time that it's in their possession to the time when it's basically irretrievably erased from existence by, being, by having all the sectors on the media overwritten or in worst case scenario. And, and, and just to clarify something too, we next use will destroy drives when clients ask us to, we advocate against it strongly. But there are cases that even when the client understands our reasoning and decides they're going to do best case scenario, both for their own liability and protection and for the environment, there are times when we still have to destroy drives. Uh, Non-functioning drives can't be overwritten. They have to be physically destroyed. As a matter of fact, it's a good example. But clients making that realization that it's really the data that carries a risk uh, to the tune of tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, that's uh, it's sort of a... Um, a, a, a sort of sea change uh, that we are starting to see more and more, uh, thankfully. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And actually, I um, there there was a there's a Morgan Stanley case, a set of cases around kind of a data data center decommission, and you serialized this in several posts on LinkedIn over time, and it was great. Um, I was riveted. <laughs> Actually, uh, because a lot of times when things go wrong in this area, you don't really have a lot of visibility to it. But this became like a regulatory issue. It became like a litigation issue with you know p individuals who are impacted. So there's a lot of public information out there about this particular case. And it's sort of it's not necessarily to beat up on Morgan Stanley, because I feel like almost it, most organizations have these troubles. Right. Uh, but this will just kind of burst out onto the scene and it's kind of a public thing. So why, why don't you start by telling telling the story about what happened with Morgan Stanley? So so what what were they trying to do? <laughs> uh, sure. What were they trying to do? And then what did they do and what happened as a result of that? Um, yeah. And just a little bit of a precursor, as you indicated, this was the best use case we could possibly have asked for. I'm hoping, and one of the reasons I serialized it on LinkedIn is I'm hoping that this is going to be a learning experience for every other company to avoid becoming Morgan Stanley, essentially. I'm, 
as you stated, I am sure this is far from an isolated incident. This is the one that happened to get get caught essentially and go public and really blow up. But a lot of other companies can avoid shooting themselves in the foot from this example. So Morgan Stanley, uh, there's two separate incidences, 2016 and 2019, but I'm going to focus mostly on the 2016 incident because that's the one we know the most about. They were, they were going to uh, decommission some data centers. Very common thing to do. One of the things we get called in on a lot. And um, they had a partner. Now, interestingly enough, Debbie, this partner, which I will name because it's in the public record, it was IBM. They're not particularly qualified to do ITAD. Uh, this is often the case, by the way. Big companies that do at least make an effort to do ITAD correctly oftentimes attach themselves to vendors that are IT manufacturers or resellers or distributors, but they're a household name. And they think, well, surely they must be able to do uh, ITAD, the end of the cycle, because they do everything leading up to it. And in this case, uh, their vendor of choice, which they moved away from to save money, uh, wasn't necessarily even the best choice to begin with. But at some point, they decided that $100,000 to uh, dispose of 4,900 assets was too much money. Um, and mind you, if you do the math on that, and I did because this is what I do, it comes out to about $12 an asset, essentially, was what it was gonna break down to, which is, which is a bargain, by the way, because sometimes we do jobs, depending on what the people are asking us to do, it can run anywhere from you know, 15 to $25 an asset. And again, that's not at all unreasonable when you're actually asking for actual proper disposal with data sanitization. But they decided to move away. And then for some bizarre reason, despite the fact that most companies have a huge constellation of stakeholders in this process, uh, legal, finance, IT asset management, cybersecurity, this company, uh, Morgan Stanley, th there seemed to be some kind of shortcut because they handed this job off to a company um, called Triple Crown. Uh, it ends up, we find out from the court reportings that they are a New York area moving company. No particular qualifications whatsoever to do anything with IT or IT asset disposition that I could find, um, but pr presumably a competent moving company in the New York based area. Uh, no idea how much they ended up paying, uh, but what did end up happening is Triple Crown then sold the assets in turn to a company called Anything IT. Now, Triple Crown claims that they subcontracted the data sanitization to Anything IT because Anything IT presumably had some understanding and capability of how to wipe drives or overwrite drives more accurately. Uh, anything IT, however, in the court recordings indicates that they were never contracted to do data sanitization. They were just sold the drives. And so as is, they took the drives and they in turn sold them to a company called uh, Cruise, uh, spelled with a K, K-R-U-S-E. And that company in turn ended up selling them through various uh, reseller channels, including uh, online. Uh, one of the people that bought those assets found unencrypted data from Morgan Stanley on one of the drives and very, very nicely, uh, instead of co contacting Revil or some other, uh, you know, major uh, cybercrime organization, instead contacted Morgan Stanley to make them aware of what they'd found. And then, um, and then from there, it basically snowballed into uh, two things so far. One is... Um, Morgan Stanley has uh, paid a $60 million fine to the federal government for that uh, data breach. And they've also just recently settled a class action lawsuit from customers whose data they lost control of. And that's another $60 million. So, so far, not counting brand damage, revenue, or any of that, we're up to $120 million to save $100,000. Oh my God. <laughs> Stunning, stunning. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah. This is unbelievable. So uh, again, I, I think, you know, I feel like the majority of companies don't know how to properly dispose of things. And like you said, you have to know, you know, the types of drives that you have, the types of media that you have. Not every company can handle all that. So that all needs to be very 
detail oriented. You definitely want to make sure, you know, you get certification that they've done that, especially if people are going to sort of reuse and repurpose those drives. So this was, there, there's a lot of laws now around kind of third party data transfer. Um, and so this creates like a huge risk if companies aren't doing, aren't making sure that that sanitization is happening properly before they decide to repurpose or sell or transfer on these drives. Yeah. Yeah, that's very accurate. And um, it's funny because now, thanks to Morgan Stanley, and and I wish I could claim credit for them providing us that awesome use case, but I can't. Uh, but thanks to that, we're now seeing companies take this a lot more seriously. And um, some of the clients that we're working with now in the financial services and healthcare industry, especially, not only are they listening to us when it comes to understanding how uh, vendors need to be certified. And Nate, by the way, it gets incredibly detailed. I, 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 don't, I don't think I made this clear when I first talked about it. The Nade standard is applied per media type. So you don't just get like a blanket. You can handle anything. It's literally per media type. You have to prove to them that you know and have repeatable, efficient you know, processes for hard disk drives. And again, for solid state drives. And again, for non-drive you know, non media. It's you have to prove you can do it on site. You have to prove you can do it back at your facilities. And there's tons and tons of uh, oversight and supervision and requirements on the physical facilities, the security of it, um, the um, video surveillance of it that they can pull records, the fact that they can walk on site and do unannounced audits anytime they want to make sure. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really... Um, really an area where companies are now starting to take it seriously. We even have clients coming to visit us, which even in the pandemic, they are coming on site to tour the facility. They want to see the data lab. Um, and if they ever set foot in a recycler, for example, another popular standard is uh, what's called R2, responsible recycling. That's literally what the R2 stands for. Uh, they've, if they've been on a recycler's facility before and then come to see uh, next use, it's like, it's like a, uh, all the difference in the world. And so in addition to understanding the certifications and having long involved vetting processes of us with all sorts of paperwork being exchanged, uh, we're seeing more and more part, uh, clients come right on site, talk to us, tour the facility, see the data destruction lab. It's extremely eye-opening to see a facility that's specialized in data destruction as opposed to a facility that's a recycler who just happens to do data destruction to the R2 standard. Right, right. Let, let's talk a little bit about chain of custody, if you touched on that. So chain of custody, a lot of times people I know talk about chain of custody in like an evidence type of thing. But I think all your assets, in addition to kind of tracking them in your typical asset management program, if you're decommissioning things, you still need to have documentation about all the different things that happen uh, to those drives and all the different people who touch stuff. Uh, I tell people, you know, I don't like to touch drives because then I have to do more paperwork. Uh, but tell me a little bit <laughs> about the importance of this chain of custody. Yeah, I you, you actually use a great analogy that I use all the time, and that is you wouldn't want evidence from a crime scene passing through people's hands that you had no idea what was happening with them or what their qualifications were to handle them. And really, uh, these assets, they may look old and they may look beat up and they may be covered in grime, depending how long they were sitting and where they were. But they really are every bit as important as evidence from a crime scene, especially with the potential uh, ramifications if they lose control of it. So understanding that it's in secure facilities with the client, that it's only being handled by people that are on a restricted asset uh, access list, right? So they are the only ones that are allowed to view the assets, touch the assets, transport the assets, and then handling those assets off like an actual physical handoff, what we call an onsite takeout, where the chain of custody transfers from the original owner of the assets to a qualified vendor like Nexus. That is huge. Um, Part of the NAID certification is making sure that once those assets are in a qualified vendor's hands, that they you know, see in a lot of cases, honestly, there'd be probably better um, chain of custody uh, supervision than they did when they were in the original owner's hands. 
uh, everything from locked and sealed trucks that are not unlocked until they arrive at the processing facility to, as I mentioned earlier, facilities with multiple layers of physical and digital security, uh, with surveillance cameras recording everything that's done to those assets at every step that are held for you know, in upwards of 90 days or longer that can be viewed at any time by the client and or by the certifying agency, in this case, NAID. Uh, so chain of custody plays a, a huge role in making sure that the data on those assets went from one responsible set of hands to another before it was physically just, you know, eliminated from existence, essentially. And then, uh, you know, that all culminates in a what's called a certificate of destruction or COD. And but being able to understand that that COD is not just a piece of piece of paper with serial numbers on it, but it's actually the culmination of monitored and controlled chain of custody steps that led to it. That makes a huge difference. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I remember times I've met people coming out of the country at the airport and they give me a drive and we got to do paperwork in the airport. (laughs) Yeah, it's really important uh, to be able to have that. Um, So let's talk a little bit about data privacy. So I think the thing that's happening with data privacy, and I want your thoughts about this. So the thing that data privacy regulation is doing, which I think is a good thing, is putting an onus on organizations to really take a look at sort of end of life cycle of data, right? So I feel like before that, a lot of companies felt like, well, I can just keep data forever, right? So now what we're seeing regulation saying you know, once your purpose has expired, you should get rid of data. And so what we're seeing now, instead of people just stockpiling things in back rooms, now they're seeing, okay, this is a risk now, a new risk that I didn't have before. So before there weren't, you you know, uh, you know, let's say there there were um, some regulations, depending on certain types of data you have, you have to keep something for like seven years or five years or three years. So data privacy regulation makes it a little bit more tricky where they're not saying, you know, there's not like a statutory limit to when you take uh, uh, get rid of data, but they're saying you need to make sure that the purpose of for which you use the data once it expires, then you should be able to dispose of that information in some way. So give, give me your thoughts about that, that change. Sure. Um, that's actually been another thing I think that's been driving companies to take this end of life uh, step or stage more seriously is the fact that you have uh, GDPR in Europe and you have CCPA in California you have a number of other states that are working on or passing data privacy laws. And so suddenly there's standards and there's probably more important than anything, Debbie, in my opinion, and it's my opinion only, we, you have actual repercussions, like reasonably significant repercussions. So I think we've probably all read about cases where a company does the totally wrong thing and they get a total slap on the wrist financially for it. But GDPR, from my understanding, and CCPA both have percentage of revenue or percentage of gross profit penalties. So instead of a company seeing a number that might bankrupt a smaller company, but is meaningless to a larger company, these penalties, financial penalties, are targeted at the at the income level and the revenue level of the offending company. So it's meant to be meaningful and painful, and nothing drives behavior changes like meaningful, painful financial penalties. So that's another thing where I wish I could claim credit. And we have had talks with congressmen and stuff before. We've been in consultative phases with Nexus before, uh, but you know I can't claim any credit, but it's definitely been a boon to companies and individuals' privacy uh, and to companies' b- bottom lines that these regulations are getting put in place. And they're having and they're and they're well written towards making sure that they're not just going to be shrugged off by the bigger uh, the bigger companies. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with that. I agree with that. And, you know, a lot of times when I look in the news about data breaches and stuff, I always look to see I follow those stories to see exactly what happened. And a lot of times 
is from this old data is that this end of life cycle data that somehow, you know, wasn't secure some way or, you know, like this more Stanley thing, maybe the asset had data on it was transferred, you know, so it, it's an epidemic of people really not taking really stock of what happens to data at end of life. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that's accurate. When we when I started with NextUse two and a half years ago, uh, I would encounter clients that said, and, and again, these are real world examples that would say um, every year, and this, so I'll give you an example of a local municipality, uh, mid-size. Uh, every year, DPW would show up in dump trucks and throw all this stuff and take it to the landfill. And I'm like, yeah, what did you do for data sanitization? Oh, DPW took it to the landfill. <laughs> and uh, so cases like that where it's really, you're starting to see a change in the mindset of what they think of when they think of end of life. And it's both environmental and from a data, data security and privacy standpoint, they're just transitioning from it's garbage, let's get rid of it, to let's make some money off it, to let's properly dispose of this like we would um, hazardous waste. And interestingly enough, by the way, uh, what again, what got me into this in the first place is a lot of these assets are indeed hazardous waste. It's just now, thanks to data privacy regulation, companies are realizing they're hazardous waste to them in more ways than one. <laughs> That's a great analogy. I've heard people try to do stuff like take a hammer to a server or drive, throw someone through a laptop in the ocean once and someone retrieved it and they were able to get the data off. So, I mean, you really, <laughs> this is not a do it yourself type of thing. You know, you definitely need a professional here and it definitely will save companies, you know, definitely a lot of money. Um, let, let's talk about budget. So I feel like when companies are doing these digital transformation projects, they really need to build this in, this this cost into their budget. So a lot of times what happens is people, they do these new projects or whatever. And then so a lot of the money is spent up front for kind of the rah-rah part of this, this rollout, right? But then the money is spent before the end of life and no one really wants to to pony up that money at the end, right? So I think thinking about data, the whole life cycle, not just kind of the start and not just kind of the, the high value data, but once the end of life has reached to the purpose of the data or the end of life to an asset, you know, that I think companies need to really think about building that into their budget. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's that's a really great way to put it. We um, one of the things that I created content about one time on LinkedIn uh, recently was someone had written an excellent article about the 19 steps in deconditioning a data center. Now, here's the thing, Debbie. This was a you know a typical poster article on LinkedIn will have 1,300 or more characters. So you're talking paragraphs and paragraphs. There was literally one sentence in there in one of the steps. Right at the end, by the way about budgeting for and properly disposing of the assets. So the, the post I made basically said a couple things. One is that that's, you know, that's like saying, get men on the moon, right? And skipping all the steps it took to getting the men and the cost <laughs> to get the men on the moon, right? And the other thing, as I said, is this stuff actually comes in, it should actually be the first step, not the last step. Because as you indicated, if you're not planning for ITAD, it becomes an afterthought. And afterthoughts, as Morgan Stanley can attest, become costly disasters. So companies need to be understanding that they need to plan and budget. And that requires time to like find a properly vetted, you know, certified and vetted vendor, establish exactly what you want to do with that vendor regarding the assets, get quotes on that vendor, Finesse the, the program structure so it's doing everything you want and it's coming in a price you are finding reasonable and then build all that in. That really needs to be done right up front. It's not a, hey, we're really almost done. I can see the finish line. Can we just toss this stuff aside and run across the finish line? No, we cannot. And uh, thanks to cases like Morgan Stanley, I think more companies are realizing. And But again, that's why I write a lot of the content I write. It's really about just trying to help educate uh, companies about the fact that it, it does have to be an integral part. And again, I'm sure IT asset managers, the ITM 
teams in these companies and the cybersecurity folks from the CISO down, I'm sure they're also advocates for these sort of like, we have to plan this stuff in, we need to budget in for it right up front. Yeah, so I guess the advice would be, don't store these things in back rooms, don't just keep them plugged up to the internet. You know, get a um, a certified vendor that knows how to handle all the types of assets that you have and don't make it be an afterthought because that could just be a disaster in the, in the making. Yeah, and more and more now we're seeing companies that are getting on. Um, so w- one of the things I try really hard to do is structure programs to meet requirements within a client's budget. And one of the best practices that we're doing with a lot of our clients now is simply developing a repetitive program. So they say, instead of piling stuff up for five years or 10 years, and then it's an absolute nightmare, what happened to those assets in the five or 10 years? Who knows, right? So now we're working with clients to do like three months, six months, annual, depending on their size, the amount of times they do IT asset refreshes, the amount of times they close facilities because they're consolidating or they're moving to the cloud or they are in a merger or acquisition. Those odd things are going to occasionally pop up, but when there's any predictability to the amount of of, uh, IT assets that they retire and a schedule for that, we can work with them to do programs where we get those assets from them on a regular basis. And then the program becomes predictable, repeatable, and more importantly, Debbie, to your last point, so do the costs, right? If you know that it's going to cost you X amount every quarter to move out X number of assets, and properly sanitize the data and dispose of the asset. So you're not getting hit with fines from data loss or from stuff ending up in landfills, you know, literally hazardous waste. It becomes a lot easier to, to structure and sell to IT and business decision makers. Excellent, I totally agree. So I always ask everyone this question, if it were the world of Clarence Smart, what would be your wish for privacy or even cyber data stuff in the future, if it were your, your wish? Uh, I'm a huge advocate of GDPR. Um, I, and the thing is, you know, from my, my content on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm a, I don't like to say the term I'm a Renaissance man, but I'm not a one trick pony, right? I pay attention to a lot of the things how they interact. So even though I'm playing my part here, working with Nexus on the iTad piece, I think GDPR has really hit the nail on the head. Data, private data belonging to people is their property. And the way uh, businesses in the US and elsewhere have treated it as a commodity to do it as they see fit, to buy and sell, to have total disregard for the owner of that data and what impact that has on them, I think that all needs to change. I think we definitely need to be looking more to the European model and treating people's private data as their property to that they get to make all the decisions about that only things get done with it when they consent to it and, and understanding what they're consenting to as well. I agree. You know, it should be it should be common sense, but we all know common sense is not common, right? Um, and there are a lot of loopholes there. But I hope that we are we will get to that place where it, people do have more control and more agency and more say over their data. So it, it's definitely having an impact. You know, I see, you know, even even companies that aren't impacted in the U.S., for example, by GDPR, they're looking very closely at what's happening with these cases in Europe because those things will have impact. You know, especially if they're doing any type of work with companies or customers in other regions of the world. Very true. Very true. Excellent. So thank you so much for being on the show. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Anyone, you all need to uh, follow uh, Mark Dobson on LinkedIn and definitely take a look at his, the write-ups that you did on the Morgan Stanley case. So there's a lot of detail there uh, as well that people really enjoy. So thank you so much again for being on the show. This is awesome. No, thanks for having me. Um, You know, it's a passion project for me it makes a paycheck but honestly it's something i'm very passionate about so i was super excited with the fact that you were going to let me give voice to some of these concepts and reach a broader audience because uh at the end of the day i think we all benefit from it i agree with that wholeheartedly well thank you so much i really appreciate it thanks debbie